Uh, thank you, Atalanti. It's a, it's a real privilege to, to be here. And um, thank you to all the participants for, for dialing in. Um, it's, uh, I'm going to try to be informative, uh, not boring, uh, and uh, try and stimulate everybody without um, teaching everybody stuff they already know. So I'm going to share my screen, if I'm allowed to. Um, someone needs to let me share. Yep, great, thank you. Um, and tell me if you can see this, guys. Can you see that okay? Great. So um, uh, I was invited to, to talk about uh, gender, food systems, and malnutrition. And um, it's a really important topic. Why is it such an important topic? Um, the intersection of these two things. First of all, at least one in three people worldwide are malnourished. The, the problem's you know, enormous. We've got 690 million people that are chronically hungry. This is, they go to bed hungry every night. They don't have enough food to fill their bellies. They're constantly hungry. We've got another 2 billion people who are, they're getting enough food, um, but they're, they're, um, they're not getting the right kind of food. They're not getting enough vitamins and minerals, which are so essential for uh, immune system function, for cognitive development, for, for human functioning, basically. And then we've got 1.9 billion people who are overweight or obese. And that number is outdated every time I present it because the number is going up, unfortunately, so rapidly. But when you put all those numbers together, you have a huge number of people that are malnourished. These are all different types of malnourishment. Mal just means poor, bad. And at the, at the core of all of those different types, the, the petals of this uh, um, somewhat malevolent flower are all the different types of malnutrition, you can, different types of malnutrition expression you can have. And at the core of all of those is uh, unhealthy diets. People not e eating enough food, not eating enough of the right kinds of food, and often eating too much of the wrong kinds of food. There are lots of other things that drive malnutrition, but food is at the core of all of these types of malnutrition. And as Atalanti said, COVID-19 is turning back the clock. Uh, this is the number of 54 million wasted children. These are very thin children under the age of five at higher risk of mortality than children who are not wasted, much higher risk of mortality. In 2010, that number was 54 million. In 2019, that number was 47 million. So it took uh, about nine years to get from there to there. And some estimates that we have from The Lancet that uh, myself and other people contributed to, published in July, Lancet, the journal, show that we are at risk of going back up to 54 million in nine months. So COVID is really, the progress we've made in nine years is threatened to be undone in just simply nine months. Now, what makes us think that um, women's status in society in terms of their autonomy, their choice, their control of resources, their freedom to do things and be things and to, to make decisions. Why, is that, and why does that matter for, for nutrition? Well, here's a study uh, that was done about five years ago and it looked at the declines in childhood malnutrition measured by something called stunting. When kids are too short for their age, you, you, think, they're, you think they're six, but they're really 10. Um, the, um, we looked at the declines between 1970 and 2010, and we said, what are the risk factors behind those declines? And we, we looked at three different types of risk factors, women's empowerment, food quality and quantity, and water and sanitation. And women's empowerment was a third of the, of the risk factor, even accounting for food, even accounting for water and sanitation. And women's empowerment the measure we used was the ratio of uh, women's life expectancy to men. In, in societies that are more equal, you expect that ratio to be about 1.1, 1.08 for women living longer than men. But in heavily unequal societies, that ratio is much closer to one. And in some cases, it's below one. So it really, women's empowerment matters for women. It also matters for their children, their families, and for societies. What are the sources of gender power imbalances? And it really is about power. That's what we're talking about here. And I've stolen a really uh, useful framework that I use a lot. 
Um, first of all, we look at unequal access to resources, but that only tells part of the picture. That is reinforced by discriminatory legal and social structures. So it's, it's legalized, this discrimination in many cases. And even if an, even if it, is, it isn't legalized, it, there are still discriminatory norms and practices that are uh, that you see, uh, even, even though the law um, doesn't overtly uh, mandate discrimination. So I'm going to go through each of these factors briefly and tell you how they relate to food and nutrition. Um, but I did want to just, uh, again, Atalati uh, alluded to this in her introduction, the COVID-19 crisis is really exacerbating gender inequality. And I was reading this uh, UNDP report that came out earlier this year, and I've got pictures of shock absorbers because women are often seen as shock absorbers in society, unfairly, of course, um, but their time and their energy is seen as more elastic and more pliable than, than anyone else. And of course it isn't. Uh, but the sectors that are heavily hit by COVID-19 in terms of jobs and incomes are dominated by female employment. This is food service delivery, garment, garment factories, and so on. Uh, violence against women has increased, as Atalanti said. The caring role is even more stressed. And women are, a preliminary evidence suggests that women are eating worse relative to men in, in the covid Era, even worse than before. So this is a, a major problem. So let me go to the first uh, area in my three blue circles, unequal access to resources. So I'm going to focus on smallholder farmers and small and medium enterprises, SME, small and medium enterprises in the food sector, because in Africa and South Asia, and this is mostly where you find most of the hunger and, and undernutrition, of course, the obesity and overweight is, is a big problem everywhere. Um, but in Africa and South Asia, and this is where GAIN, uh, the organization I work for, uh, mostly works, smallholder farmers and small and medium enterprises produce, handle, trade, and market 70% of fresh food. And, and fresh food is the food that low-income consumers tend to buy. It tends to be higher in, in nutrients and uh, high-quality proteins. So it really matters. If smallholder farmers and SMEs are not working properly, then that's impairing the access to nutritious foods for low-income consumers. So here's a, a review. It's a bit old now. It's done 10 years ago. I don't expect the numbers to have changed much, but it's a really nice review because it looks at access to uh, differential access between uh, women farmers and men farmers in terms of access to technology. That's the bar on the left. Access to water and soil management techniques. That's the next one. Access to agricultural extension and labor and then access to social and political capital. And it, it, it basically looks at studies, each one of these numbers is a study, and it looks at studies that are a good high quality studies. It's called a systematic review. So it only includes studies that are good studies from a methodology point of view. And if you look at the left-hand column, for example, it says there are about um, 30 or 40 studies that they looked at and uh, in 23 of the studies, the green, they found no difference between access between male farmers and female farmers to technology related to input uh, uh, use, access and adoption. But where they did find discrimination and differences is the blue area. The blue area where there is discrimination and uh, differential access, it always favors men. So the orange is where women are favored and you can see how small that uh, color is in the chart. The blue is the, is the color that you see most often when there is uh, favoritism. But I've included the green because I think it's important to say it's not always, uh, it's not always a discrimination against women, against women. Where there is discrimination, it, it is against women, but there isn't always discrimination. But that's a pretty comprehensive and pretty convincing quantitative uh, conclusion that women are discriminated against when it comes to access to farm inputs. And it's the same for female entrepreneurs in the, in the food business. And this is, a this is a study from Jemima uh, Njuki and Njuku. And, and she's, um, she's painstakingly documented access of uh, women, women and male entrepreneurs to bank accounts uh, in selected countries in, in Africa. And again, you can see that the male bars are much higher than the, the female bars especially in Kenya and Zambia. Again, it's difficult to get access to resources for women. And if you're a small and medium business entrepreneur and you can't get a bank account, that's a big problem for you.
So that's there's fairly convincing evidence that there's, there's unequal access. What about the legal and social structures that are underpinning this? Uh, what do they look like? Well, again, we, we have, we're fortunate that we have a, a really convincing uh, and solid World Bank report from 2016 uh, that looks very in-depth at legal restrictions on women's, a whole range of things, but I've picked out the evidence from uh, women's employment and women's entrepreneurship. And again, the numbers in the pie chart are countries. And you can see that only 18 countries, that's the blue, have no legal gender differences in terms of women's employment and entrepreneurship. And that's pretty extraordinary. And 58 countries, which is the orange bar, have one, one or two uh, legal gender differences. And then some 30 countries have more than 10 uh, legal gender differences. So this is a big problem. What are some of those, what are some of those things? Well, they're pretty fundamental. I mean, in 32 countries at the top here, uh, women are not, um, married women are not able to apply for a passport. Uh, that's extraordinary. I mean, again, this audience probably knows that, but until I read this number, I was, I was kind of astounded by it. Um, only in 22 countries, women cannot confer citizenship to their children. Uh, in 17 countries, they cannot travel outside the home. So, you know, this is, this is pretty fundamental uh, uh, absence of freedoms that are important for a whole range of things, but they're also very important for, for producing, supplying, uh, marketing of nutritious foods. And it really matters, you know, this, it, it matters in so many ways, but from a business perspective, this really matters. And here's a simple plot chart that says, the more the, the, the higher number of legal gender differences, the less likely it is that a firm will be headed by a female entrepreneur, a female manager. So again, it's not terribly surprising, but you see that the more, the more gender restrictions em embodied in the law, the less likely it is that women are going to be able to be entrepreneurs. Um, and you know, that really matters because it matters for them, but it also matters because we assume entrepreneurial skills are equally divided between men and women. And it means that we, the, the world is squandering um, so much entrepreneurial energy and creativity. So the third area I want to look at is even if there are no legal uh, forms, overt forms of discrimination, what about discriminatory social norms and practices? And here I pick on the unfortunate men in this mantle, which was at the Global Summit on Women in 2014. I'm sure many of you have seen this. Um, uh, that's, that's sort of that previous picture was a bit gratuitous and impressionistic, but here's a real study a really rigorous study that came out last year that I just find absolutely fascinating. Again, it's by the World Bank Policy Research Team. And they actually, uh, it's in Turkey, and they actually constructed an experiment where they set up fake loan applications. Uh, and the fake loan applications were from men and from women, and they were allocated at random to a bunch of loan officers in Turkey. So it is exactly the same loan applications uh, randomly allocated to a bunch of loan officers um, from, and the, and the loans were from men and from women. And it was very clear that they were from men and from women. And as you can see, um, eight, the, the, the men got 8% greater loans on average than the women. 35% um, of, the, of the loan officers were biased against women. Remember, these are identical loan applications. And, um, Fascinatingly enough, the bias was not related to the sex of the loan officer. So the, the male loan officers are just as, uh, the female loan officers are just as biased against women as the male loan officers. The bias did diminish with experience in the job. So that again, that's encouraging um, that it's not sort of set in stone. But again, I think it just gives you a real insight into the differences that are apparent. So, but you can, you can fight this and within programs and with the, within initiatives. And I wanted to give you one example before I finish of uh, something that GAIN and the World Food Program co-convene. It's called the Scaling Up Nutrition Business Network. And it's, um, it's a network that brings together small and medium enterprises in, a, in about 30 countries. Uh, and it's about 100 SMEs per country. So there's quite a lot of them. And it brings them together. They're, these are SMEs who have said, we want to do something positive for nutrition. 
But very often, men tend to dominate these networks. So working with our colleagues at the World Food Programme and our national network conveners, we've come up with sort of four, four simple but important things to do to sort of counter this, this trend. First of all, for convenings and trainings and events, again, figure out when our female network members uh, figure out what their preferences are for timing and location. So again, it's not rocket science. It's just something that's so easily overlooked. Uh, men and women have differences in preference for timing and location. And if you want women to actively participate in the networks, you've got to take that into account. For the business pitch, com we run lots of competitions for businesses where they get, they get to pitch their idea to potential investors. Again, if you don't have gender balanced panels, you're, in, you're, you're running into a problem. So again, the people that the people are pitching to, they have to be gender balanced. And again, it sounds obvious, but it doesn't happen that often in practice. Um, in terms of partnerships and advocacy, we have to act, act, actively go and partner with women's business associations and chambers of commerce. Often chambers of commerce have have female networks, we have to actively reach out to those to expand membership. And in terms of the network oversight and the monitoring, we have to collect data by, by gender, both, both in terms of membership, attendance, and critically speaking time, because men do tend to dominate these, these kinds of meetings. So my conclusions, uh, Atlanti, um, differing pa different power relationships between men and women matter, of course, in their own right, but they also really matter for, for, for fighting malnutrition and hunger. Um, and the different power relationships are most immediately manifest. You see them most, most uh, manifestly, most, most uh, transactionally, I suppose, or most uh, instrumentally in unequal access to resources, whether that's credit, information, technology, uh, finance, support, but it's powerfully re reinforced by laws and critically by norms. And my conclusion is food systems just cannot be transformed if gender asymmetries and power are not transformed. Thanks, Atlanti.